starting off this episode with a little throwback to the last episode where I mentioned that things that are meh on the surface become really, really cool when you take them underwater. And never has that been truer for anything than with ships. Specifically, shipwrecks. There's nothing really like a wreck, is there? Seeing a giant superstructure submerged in an otherworldly environment becoming a key integral part to a brand new ecosystem, gradually succumbing to the slow decay of time over many years. Whoa, that's a mouthful to start off with. But there is an element of truth to it, isn't there? You're basically taking a big steel or wooden or whatever material, big superstructured hull, putting it in an environment, or at least under the environment which it was meant to be used in, and it becomes essentially a new kind of reef, a new integral part of the ecosystem. Aside from that, the history, the swim throughs, all the other things that we're going to discuss in this video, wrecks are awesome. And you guys and girls, our lovely GUE community, have tasked me this week by way of democratic vote on our YouTube community tab to discuss the top 10 Red Sea shipwrecks. Now I've actually been diving in the Red Sea quite a few times in my life, I'm very lucky in that way, but I haven't dived a few of these shipwrecks. In fact, most of them. But if you're wondering, why me then? Why am I qualified to, you know, talk about wrecks which I essentially haven't dived on? Um, aside from the fact that I had a really good support team around me to provide me with information, I did a lot of research myself, and if you're still wondering, yeah, but you have a dive them, you're not the right guy to talk about this. Well, sometimes stuff just happens. If you are someone who has been affected by a British idiot talking about wrecks which he seemingly knows nothing about, you are not alone. Just dial 0800 Stuff Just Happens. Someone will always be there to take your call and help you through this difficult time. Jokes aside though, I cannot thank our team in the Red Sea enough, so I'd like to give a special shout out to Olga Martinelli and to the owner of Red Sea Explorers, Mr. Faisal Kalaf, who have been integral in helping me get the footage that you're going to see in this video, some of the photos, as well as a lot of the information, which, some of which I researched myself, but some of which these guys provided, so big thank you to the both of them, and to all of the people who helped me with this video. And just before we get into it, last little thing, we are going to do this as kind of a two-parter. What I mean by that is that this isn't going to be two videos, but this video is going to have a very clear distinction because the first five wrecks I'm going to talk about are going to be the ones that you've probably heard of, you know, the iconic wrecks, the popular ones. And the next five that I'm going to talk about are going to be ones that you haven't heard of. Maybe. And on that note, I would like to really emphasize this, that getting information on those last five wrecks that you're going to see in this video has been tricky. And I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. So with all that said, I'm Nico Luro from Global Underwater Explorers. Please be sure to like the video, share the video with any divers who you think may be interested. Please be sure to tickle that notification bell and hit that subscribe button. These are the top 10 Red Sea shipwrecks in no particular order. Thistlegorm. Okay, let's get the one everyone knows ticked off the list. But I don't say that negatively. Thistlegorm is known by everyone for damn good reason. It is a world-class dive. Now, I've been lucky enough to dive a few times. Times Magazine even voted this one of the top 10 wreck dives in the world. I haven't done the top 10 wreck dives in the world, but I get it. At this stage, everyone knows the story. It was a British cargo vessel that was sunk in 1941 by German bombers and rediscovered in the 1950s by Jacques Cousteau. Now, what Cousteau did was actually quite clever because he enlisted the help of local fishermen to find the wreck. And I'd like everyone just to remember that using local fishermen because it's an important point that I'm going to relate to a bit later on in the video. The vessel was carrying some pretty cool cargo too. Everything from motorcycles, airplane parts, boots, guns. Lots of guns. And even two train carriages. Wow! And even cooler, all of this stuff can still be seen when you go diving. However, I hate to bring back this character so early, but... If I can get serious for a moment, there are two major issues I have discovered when diving this wreck. First issue, as the wreck is most popular, 
It welcomes a large populace of divers on a yearly basis, reinforcing said popularity. And as a result, to ferry this amount of divers to the site, there are many, many boats. And some, I do not say names, and I do not accuse all boats, I say some. Some boats have become accustomed to mooring to the shipwreck and ripping chunks of the boat off. I would very much like to tell these boat operators to stop their nonsense, show a bit of decorum and respect, and leave history alone. Second issue, and this, one could argue, is related to the first issue, relating to popularity. As what goes hand in hand with many divers is many bubbles. <laughs> now believe it or not, despite the fact that this is regarded as one of the top 10 wreck dives in the world, I have experienced it when it is actually quite disappointing, as I have seen more bubbles than boots, more fins than train carriages, and uh, what is really quite crucial, and this is why I encourage everyone to do this with global underwater explorers on one of our creative trips, as logistics are fundamental to having a good time on this wreck. If you go at the time when all the other boats are there, expect bubbles. Many, many bubbles. That said, if you follow the points that I just mentioned and actually plan and dive this wreck properly, it is absolutely fabu. I'm not gonna lie, I still to this day remember my first dive on the Thistleborn. It'll stay with me forever. The boats, the guns, the motorcycles. I was having so much fun on this wreck. I was making noises like a like a goat giving birth. Not that I think goats giving birth are exciting or fun. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the bottom line is, the Thistlegorm is absolutely deserving of being on this list. It is a world-class wreck, and if you haven't dived it, please put it right at the top of your bucket list, because it's an, oh, it's a worldie. Janice D. She's a big girl, this one. 280 meters long, big girl. And great news for us recreational divers, she can be dived by us because she sits in only 24 meters of water. Awesome! Some of you may know who have either seen me on the videos with Michael Manduno, link above, or who have seen my previous top 10 video, that my main modus operandi for getting in the water, underwater photography. That is why I like to dive. And this wreck speaks to me. Like, is this the most photogenic wreck ever? I don't know, I haven't dived all the wrecks, but what I do know is I look at these images and it makes me feel all oogly boogly in my tum tum. I mean, the wreck is like a diver's playground for those who are trained. There are so many swim throughs, so many passages to explore, so many open areas where you can just get awesome shots of video and photo. I mean, it, it, it's so beautiful and majestic, it's almost worthy of a David Attenborough narration. As we move around the mangled remnants of history, one can only stop and appreciate. Okay, I'm gonna stop there because it actually almost feels like I'm disrespecting the great man. David, I'm sorry. Also, can we all remember that Sir David is over 90 years old now, so I need everyone out there to send love and good vibes and happiness out into the universe and send energy to keep David Attenborough alive forever. That can't happen. Now I'm sad. But getting back on point, getting back to the wreck, what's even cooler, aside from the wreck being one of the most photogenic, playful things I have ever seen, speaking of playful, what you will often find around Janesty is a really playful pod of dolphins. So you basically get two for the price of one. You get a wreck, and a good one at that, a damn good one at that, and you get dolphins to play with. SS Carnatic. Something I probably should have mentioned for the last wreck entry, the Janus D, is she sunk off of a reef in 1983 called Abu Nuhas. And likewise for the SS Carnatic. Abu Nuhas is actually known as the Four Wreck Reef. Just there's four wrecks around there. Or allegedly, there's supposed to be even more. There's even meant to be one, I believe, called the Olden, which is this legendary shipwreck. Anyway, more on that another time. Basically, around Abu Nuhas, many wrecks. SS Carnatic's 
quite a special one though. She's a very, very old vessel. One of the oldest in the Red Sea, in fact. She's an old steamship that also had sails that was built way back in 1862 and used to cruise between Suez and Bombay. She didn't sail for long though because she actually sank in 1869. But here's the crazy part, wasn't discovered until 1984. She had some pretty special cargo on her too, everything from copper and gold, even to wine. And what's cool is that you can still see some of these 19th century wine bottles on the ship now. Getting a tad nerdy here, but my favorite trivia fact about the SS Carnatic is that in Jules Verne's novel, Around the World in 80 Days, Phileas Fogg is actually meant to be catching a vessel that was supposed to take him from Hong Kong to Yokohama. The name of that vessel? The SS Carnatic. Nice coincidence. Maybe meant, maybe not, doesn't matter, it's cool. Rosalie Moller. This wreck's got a really interesting history. Her fate is actually quite closely tied to the aforementioned Thistlegorm. So I mentioned before that the German bombers blew up the Thistlegorm in 1941. What I failed to mention though is that when they were bombing the Thistlegorm, they actually hit the munitions cache. And the explosion was apparently so big that it, that it lit up the night sky. And as it did so, it revealed the location of Rosalie Muller. The Axis forces returned a few days later and bombed poor Rosalie into the water. As a dive though, sadly, this is one for those who are trained to go a bit deeper. I know this is for some of you going to cue some of you going, YAY! And for others of you are going to be going, BOO! It is what it is. To give you some idea, the top of the masts, which have now fallen, but they were the top of them at 20 metres. The first decks were at 34 metres. Ah, sorry, at 34 and the bottom of the ship, the hull, all the way down at the propellers at about 50 meters. So, some depth. And aside from the depth, another thing that you need to take into account with this dive is that the visibility in this area is usually not the best. So, and that can add a little bit of spookiness to the wreck. Now I've referenced proper training a few times, but this wreck really, I emphasize, proper training. You want to get, make sure you're deco trained properly, you want to make sure you're try and mix trained properly, and to do all of that great wonderful training to appreciate the Rosalie Muller, you can do this with one of our great GUE instructors. Just go to our website. Shameless plug, Ulysses. Another old girl this one, dating all the way back to 1887. And just like the Carnatic, she's an old kind of steamboat but with the sail, so steamboat sailboat. Very pretty wreck this one, and sometimes known locally as the cable wreck, as her, her main cargo was big drums of cables, which actually when you go diving now, you can see scattered all over the place. So, cable wreck. The good news, back again for us recreational divers, because the Ulysses sits in just 24 meters of water, so reachable for us. The bad news, the point where Ulysses sank off of Gubal Island generally has strong, and I mean strong current. So really, I, I emphasize this, this is one of those dives where you want to think about having maybe a scooter, but more appropriately, the right set of fins. Humor me, but let's make it two for two with the shameless plugs. Dorota recently did a video uh, from Versus Monday about soft fins versus rigid fins, link above. If you are heading to Egypt and thinking of diving the Ulysses, I really suggest you check out that video just to see what fins might be the right choice for you specifically for that dive. I mean, worst case scenario, you can always just do it as a drift dive, you drop in one point, drift, get picked up at another. The wreck's awesome, and side note, the coral life there, wow! But I'd like to take it back to the beginning now. You remember I mentioned during uh, my little rundown of the Thistlegorm that the way Cousteau found the Thistlegorm was by using local fishermen. Well, I also gave a shout out at the beginning of the video to Mr. Faisal Khalaf, who, as owner of the Red Sea uh, Explorers operation in Liverboard, he's actually done something in the modern day that's quite similar. He's used local fishermen to actually find some new wrecks. So. I mean, <laughs> and thanks to that, for my personal benefit, and now also for yours, he has provided me with a certain amount of information, footage, and photography that is now going to allow me to talk to you about the five Red Sea wrecks you haven't heard of, maybe. But I'd kind of like to make a point of how difficult this was to put together, this next part. Hey, man. Glad we're finally able to talk about this project. Okay, okay, okay. What do you want? Huh? 
Well, I'd actually like as much info as possible. I mean, I'm thinking video, photos, uh, you know, as much as you can get me. You know, and if you could also give me names, depths, GPS coordinates, yeah, basically everything, please. Ma. Okay, well, let's do this. How about you send me, I don't know, as much video as possible. No. Okay, fine, understandable. How, how about at least your best clips, just so the video, you know, pops? No. Okay, I would like at least, bare minimum, 30 seconds of video free trek and at least some photos. Okay. I also get GPS coordinates for the Rex. No. Okay, then how about vessel specs and information? No. Some info? Okay, within a reason. Thanks, man. And since I'm doing a promo for you, obviously when I next go out to Egypt, you're going to take me to dive on these wrecks, right? No. I promise I'll make a great video for you. No. What if I do it as part of a GUE creative trip, like, say, this coming June? Okay. Hey! <laughs> Main point I'm making, this footage was not easy to get a hold of at all. But jokes aside, Face Sal has been absolutely amazing. That was just for comedy, of course. Also, don't know if you caught it, sign up for our GUE creative trip in June 2021. <laughs> That's three shameless plugs. Please still hit that like button. And jokes aside, now let's get a bit more deeper and a bit more technical. Al Kamar Al Saudi Al Misa. Al Kamar Al Saudi Al Misa. <laughs> Try saying that fast five times. What a mouthful. This ship, definitely one of the newer wrecks we've got in the Red Sea, and definitely one of the newer wrecks not just to be dived, but that was actually built. She was constructed in the 1970s in Italy and sunk in 1994. On the eve that she sunk, she was actually carrying 500 passengers and 60 members of crew on her return ship from Jeddah to Suez. Now, what allegedly what happened is that a boiler room explosion occurred and that led to a fire on the boat and... Can we just reflect on this, please? A fire on a boat. Like, th that is honestly the stuff of nightmares. It's, it's, some people are afraid of the sea. I've never understood that, but you know, compound that with <laughs> having a fire on the sea. Because there's only one way, abandoned ship. That, that's scary for me. Personally speaking, people were rescued by a US Navy destroyer, I believe, called the USS Briscoe. Put yourself in the mind of these people. That Navy vessel is 25 miles away. Granted, these people were on lifeboats, but there's some floating time going on there while that US uh, destroyer is coming in. That must have been quite nerve-wracking for the passengers. Now, in terms of the wreck itself, this is a deep one. The wreck itself was rediscovered, I guess you would call it, back in... Uh, 2006 and it's definitely technical diving range this one because it's the, the ranges are between sort of 60 to 83 meters so for people like me I don't have training yet unfortunately I can't go which is a shame because the wreck looks <laughs> very cool to get to the wreck was kind of a race between two dive teams and fun fact that everyone's favorite person on the channel Miss Dorota Cherne was actually on one of those teams when they went to find the wreck so Nice relation story there. Thesov. Or is it Tesov? I might be pronouncing this wrong, my bad. Tesov, Thesov, potato, potato. I'm gonna keep this segment relatively short because we actually have an existing video on the YouTube channel, link above. But it kind of gives you the full story of when this wreck was discovered back in July 2018. It's a really cool video. You've got the local fisherman who helped us to find the wreck being interviewed, Faisal himself, who I've mentioned a few times on this video, is on there. GUE president JJ Jared Jablonski is on there. So it's really worth a watch to see firsthand the discovery of the shipwreck. It's an awesome watch. Anyway, the condensed version, as I said, it was discovered back in July 2018, which seems so long ago after this crazy year. But it was a collaboration between Red Sea Explorers, GUE, some of the local fishermen, and they uncovered this absolute beauty of a wreck, which I believe sank back in 1965, if I'm not wrong. I'm particularly fond of this shot of Dorota stroking the bell. All sorts of jokes on this show. <laughs> Fulika. The story of how this wreck was actually found is, is quite extraordinary. It's literally like Jacques Cousteau meets Sherlock Holmes. 
Um, there is, I don't want to feel like I'm detracting from you guys, but there are people who have talked about the finding of this wreck in far greater detail and for far longer than this video permits. I will leave a link to that down below. Um, but essentially the way they went about finding this was to identify it, they found like um, emblems of the shipwreck, they had to cross-reference that back with shipping companies and their log history. I mean, the lengths that people went to to find and identify the Shrek effectively, astounding. Check out the video down below, it's, it's, it's superb. Tiny bit of detail though, just before we move on, she was built in the spring of 1878 and sank as soon as 1880, so she's an old vessel and sadly didn't have very long before the sea took her. But, you know what? It's wrecks like this, when you, which, especially in hindsight of seeing this, the, you know, the video that I've left the link to below, it's really wrecks like this that, you know, the discovery of them and the means by which you discover them that really make you feel like an explorer? Ha! The name makes sense. San Juan. Not often you hear this, but I guess it goes hand in hand with the name. The San Juan is actually a Panamanian ship of all things. I haven't heard of many of those. I mean, maybe I'm misinformed. She was built back in 1990 and sank in 1941 after a uh, collision off of Ras Abu Bakr Reef. Now, this is, I've been asked to keep hush hush about this wreck. This is one that is, it's a very, very new discovery. So it might be your first time hearing about it, in which case, great but we have got to remain relatively hush-hush about this one. Uh, details on her are limited. We've got a few cool images for you here. But, can, again, it's 2020. You know, the great age of discovery seems to, for a lot of people my generation and the generations below, you know, the great age of discovery feels a bit like a thing of the past. And it's just so great to see that in an area like the Red Sea, which has so many divers going there, that we still get to make discoveries like this. It's, but it really feels like Final Frontier stuff. And I'm blessed to be a part of even making a video on something like this. Amirante Barroso. <laughs> Many of you screaming at me now going, it's Amirante Barroso. This one is a very recent discovery from February 2018. So details are still quite scarce. What we do know about the SS Amirante Barroso is that she was a three-masted Brazilian warship that sunk in 1893. Juxtapose how recent the discovery is of only being two years ago with how old the shipwreck is, and it just, it makes the whole thing that much more special. Also juxtaposition, there's a big word for a Monday. Anyway, the wreck is one of those old school square sailed Pirates of the Caribbean like warships, absolutely steeped in history. To have something like this available to us, you know, in the Red Sea, it, does it get better than this? Here's actually a quick image of her in a photogrammetry. I'd like to shout out uh, Case Beamster who sent this through at the 11th hour. So really massive thanks for making this video that much cooler. But I mean, here's kind of what she looks like. And this is the last wreck I'm talking about. So let's end on a high. I would like everyone out there, take a big breath in. <laughs> And can we just reflect on how incredible it is that we're finding wrecks like this still to this day? I mean, oceanic exploration is just fabu. So voila, my friends, there are 10 Red Sea shipwrecks for you broken down, some with more detail, some with less detail. I would like to emphasize, though, that the Red Sea it, it's, it's a treasure trove of shipwrecks, and there are certainly a lot more than 10. We are literally just touching the surface with this video. So maybe there's actually a wreck that you've dived or that you've heard of that we haven't featured in this video. Let me know what it is. Put your comment down below. You know we're very vigilant with our comment section. I'll see it, we'll shout it out, and we may even feature it in a future top 10. Who knows? And I have to say, I absolutely loved making this video. Um, but because of this damn pandemic, it has been so long since I've been in the water that while editing it and looking at all this cool footage and putting it all together, 
a little bit of water came out my eye. But that's enough from me, as always, if you have liked the video, please hit that thumbs up button, tickle that notification bell, please hit that subscribe button, and be sure guys to share the video and let divers that you know in your life know about this video and about the channel. Just a small disclaimer, I'm actually going to be away for uh, part of December, uh, but the videos will not stop. While I'm away, the channel will keep pushing out videos every single Monday at 4pm, you know the time, you know the day. But what that does mean is that I'm going to have to edit videos in advance, so for the coming weeks there aren't going to be any polls. But you still will be getting a top 10 video next month. You might have an indication what it might be if you voted on the last poll, it was the one you didn't vote for. Sorry. <laughs> it's just one of those things where I need to get videos out to you lovely people, you will still be getting great content, and I need to make sure that the channel doesn't just collapse while I'm away. So you guys keep watching, the videos will keep coming. I will look like I'm here, but I won't be. So less polls, and we'll make it work. So that's all from me. I've been Nico Lura of Global Underwater Explorers, and I'll see you guys on the next Top 10 Show.